So I'm coming to you from Ontario. Uh, my name is Kate Dupuis. I am a clinician. I'm a clinical neuropsychologist, which means I'm the type of psychologist who specializes in changes to the brain. And I work at Sheridan College, which is located in Oakville, Ontario, but I've like, I'm sure many of you have been sort of uh, at home in Toronto. And I'm also affiliated with the Schlegel University of Waterloo Research Institute for Aging, which is located in Waterloo, Ontario. And today I'll be speaking to you about a topic that is near and dear to my heart. I spent four years of my training at Baycrest Health Sciences in Toronto, working in their hearing, hearing services clinic. And today I'll be chatting with you a little bit about understanding the connections between hearing loss and changes to our thinking skills, including dementia. And although I have moved on from that previous role in a lot of the work that I do right now, I work in long-term care. And many folks who are living in these types of settings will experience changes to their thinking skills and also changes to their hearing and their communication. So I'm definitely eager to speak with you today and I'm going to make sure that I leave a lot of time at the end for questions. And um, some of you may have come in after we were discussing this, but if you have questions, you can put them in the chat box. And if there's anything that you really need to chat about, you know, say, I want to talk about this right now and I'm completely happy to just pause and try and answer questions as we go along. Okay. So I'll get started. So today I have three general objectives for you and I understand people are coming from all across. It seems I was going to say all across the province, but it looked like we had people from across the country and I saw someone from New Hampshire. So across the continent, it looks like. So people are coming from different places. So I'm going to be talking sort of in terms of generalities people's provinces, states may have different rules and regulations around hearing care. So we'll be talking sort of in general. But what I'd like to do is to share a bit of the information, a bit of the research about the connections between our hearing and our thinking as we get older. I'll talk a little bit about some potential solutions that maybe you've tried with your loved one or yourself. Maybe you're thinking of trying for managing hearing loss. So what do we know are sort of the best practices we can use? And also, if this is something that you maybe have been thinking about, but you haven't quite taken that step, maybe some ways that we can work on it and try and advocate to ensure that your hearing care is, is taken care of in addition to all the other types of care that are happening. Oh, the volume is quite uneven. Okay, well, I'll try and put my, I move around a lot when I talk, so perhaps I'm moving too much and my microphone is moving. That is better, Kate. Is it? Okay, I'll just hold this like this. <laughs> <laughs> so the first thing we'll do is we'll talk a little bit about those connections between, um, oh, Mary's saying it's just your audio, I'm sorry, between hearing loss and dementia. And so I really take sort of what I think of as a really interdisciplinary approach. So as I mentioned, I am a neuropsychologist. I am not a, a, an audiologist or a, um, I do not practice hearing care. I am more interested in the brain and our thinking skills and what changes as we age. But where I'm going to be sort of is in this Venn diagram overlap. This is where I'll be today so that we can really get a sense of how do these two things interact? Why is it so important for us to think about our ears when we're talking about how our brains change as we get older? And of course, you know, everything old is new again. This isn't anything that I've come up with on my own. This, there, there's a long standing research tradition of connecting these two areas going back to, you know, here the 1940s, the 1960s, looking at why are changes to how we think, why or how can those be impacted by changes to how we hear. And so I guess you may be thinking, well, this is an interesting topic for today, but why are we going to spend this whole time focusing on this? Why do we focus on the connections between hearing loss and cognitive health? Why is this such an important consideration for ourselves as we get older and for those of us on the call who may be caring for or supporting older people in their lives? And so I'd like to show you this chart here. And what you can see on the left-hand side are some common things that we see in people who are experiencing changes to their thinking skills as they get older. And on the right, you'll see 
some common changes that we see for folks who are experiencing changes to their hearing as they get older. And you'll see there is a lot of overlap. So oftentimes what we start to question is, oh, I told mom three times I'm picking her up at seven. Why can't she remember? I told her, I said, at seven o'clock, I'm coming to get you. But maybe mom never heard you in the first place. And that's why she's not able to remember that you're coming to pick her up at seven. Maybe when you're out in a, I was going to say in a busy restaurant, maybe in BC, it's better here in Ontario. Not a lot of people I think are going to restaurants right now. Um, but when you're out in a noisy restaurant, maybe, maybe your husband tends to just kind of drift away and disengage from the conversation. Is that because perhaps he doesn't understand the conversation? Maybe some of the words he no longer picks up on? Or is he not able to hear, especially in a loud environment like a restaurant where there's often a lot of dishes and clanging noises and lots of people talking? So difficulty following conversations or difficulty understanding the words that people are saying, repeating questions, issues with our memory, our thinking skills, maybe withdrawing from experiences and experiencing symptoms of loneliness or social isolation. All of these are things that we see in those with cognitive loss, such as someone living with a dementia. And we also commonly see in people who have hearing loss that perhaps hasn't been uh, diagnosed or hasn't been addressed. And so it's really important for us to consider both of these pieces together, because of course we don't ever want to be making an assumption about someone's thinking skills and thinking, oh, well, look at all these changes to their memory and their comprehension, where maybe it was actually a hearing loss that was going on. So it's really important as a clinician to always be thinking about all the different reasons why people may be showing these types of behaviors. Now, prevalence of hearing loss, believe it or not, is actually the third most common medical condition. So that's after hypertension, high blood pressure, and arthritis. Hearing loss is very common. It's sometimes a little bit difficult to get the handle on exactly how many people have hearing loss as they're older, and I'll talk about why that may be in a little bit. But we think probably about a third of folks are over the age 65 plus, and at least half of the folks over the age of 80 to 85. So it's quite a significant number. And in my own work within the long-term care sector, we know at least here in Ontario, the average age of folks who are living in a long-term care setting is 84 which to my mind when I'm thinking of this clinically is, well, that probably means that at least half the people I'm working with within my own, um, my own research, my own time with them are probably having trouble with their hearing. So that sort of, you know, pins it to me to make sure that I'm communicating very well. And we'll talk together about some communication strategies that you may already be using or may be new to you that can help you when you're communicating with older individuals. Now, the number one risk factor for hearing loss is actually, believe it or not, age. And as we know, Canadians are now living older than ever before. So we have a lot of data coming out of Statistics Canada talking about, you know, we are living in a time of medical marvels. We have vaccines, clean, uh, you know, cleaner environments. Um, there's a lot of factors that are coming into play that are allowing folks to live for longer than ever before. And actually one of the fastest growing groups in Canada are people who are centenarians, so people age 100 and above. So if people are living longer, that probably means statistically more and more of the folks that are living longer are probably also going to have hearing loss. So as our population continues to age here in Canada and uh, around the world, um, it will become even more of a, a health imperative, a public health imperative for us to start to address hearing loss and make sure that people are getting treatment for this particular condition because it is so common. Now, Age-related hearing loss is typically the most common type of hearing loss. It often has a very gradual onset. So it's difficult if you're talking to uh, an audiologist to say, oh, it was on this day that I woke up and I noticed, you know, 
my my partner couldn't hear me as well as before. It's typically a very slow, gradual onset, typically affects those higher frequencies. So all of those consonants like s, t, p, that are really important when we're having conversations with our friends or our family, coworkers. Um, and we know that as it's not just our ears that hear, we also hear with our brain. So as we get older, many of us will find that it takes a little bit longer to process information, or it's harder for us when we're in a busy setting to tune out the background noise. And so all of this combined can impact our communication and our daily interactions with folks. And of course, now in the time of COVID, where a lot of people maybe aren't as interactive as they once were, they're not going out and doing the things that they were even more important for than ever before that we try and maintain those interactions. We try and maintain our communication as well as we can, because we know that it's so important to stay connected to each other, even if it is, you know, this way over, over the video camera. So to talk a little bit about the research between that link between hearing loss and cognitive loss, again, We've known for a long time, I remember these papers here that I'm quoting when I was an undergraduate at Concordia University uh, in 2001, 2002. This wasn't very long ago, but now I'm looking at these numbers, 94, 97, and I'm thinking, okay, well, 20 to 30 years ago, we were already starting to look at how our thinking skills may change in a very uh, uh, sort of in a way that's sort of hand in hand with how our vision and our hearing changes as we get older. So that that idea that there's changes in all of our senses and all of our, our functions, that isn't necessarily new. But what is a little bit new, and now it's about a decade ago now that a team from Baltimore was really starting to look into this, was really that if you control for a lot of things that we think are associated with developing dementia as we get older. So you take all of those out of the equation, you control for them. What you tend to see is that the likelihood of developing dementia is actually connected to and likely to be proportional to your degree of hearing loss. So the more severe the hearing loss, the greater the risk. And if you actually want to sort of get down to it, there's actually what we call like odds ratios where you can look at if you have a more mild hearing loss, you have a lower risk. If you have a more severe hearing loss, you may have a larger risk. So this seemed to really energize the field. I mean, a lot of people had anecdotally been noticing this before, but really within the last 10 years, what you've seen is a huge growth in research all across the world looking at these large scale data sets with lots of like thousands and thousands of people and looking at these connections and saying, okay, so we've seen this connection. What do we do? How can we mobilize people? And so that's one of the reasons why I'm so glad to be speaking with you here today. I don't know everyone's individual hearing status, of course, but you know, if it's a an opportunity for us to, to bring this to the forefront, to talk a little bit about this and to share some of the data, I think that will be a really meaningful opportunity and a good interaction for us to have today. So you may be thinking, oh, okay, well, that's a little weird. Why in the world would there be this connection between hearing loss and cognitive loss? Like obviously the brain and the ears are all connected, but what's going on? Because, you know, I think humans, we're always trying to find solutions to things. So if we can understand what the connection is, then maybe we can try and tackle it and say, okay, well, if this is the reason for it, let's try this particular solution. So there's been a number of potential explanations. Obviously, it's really difficult to know 100% because, you know, you can't ethically socially isolate one group of people and not another group of people and then look to see whether one of them has a stronger connection than the other. We couldn't ever do that. But what you can do is you can look at large scale data sets and try and come up with possible reasons for this connection. So some of the possible reasons could be that if you do have hearing loss, and you may think of yourself, I mean, even right now as I'm giving this talk, 
There's the rain outside. I probably should have closed the window. I can also hear my kids upstairs because, of course, it's five o'clock in Toronto. And so they're banging around with my husband. And so I'm trying not to listen to them. <laughs> and so I know right now my brain is working pretty hard. And I'm trying to block them out, talk to you, listen, try and make sure I'm saying the right words correctly. That takes a lot of a lot of what we call cognitive reserve, a lot of effort. And over time, some scientists hypothesize, the more that we do this effortful type of hard work in our brain, our brain starts to get tired. And so maybe if you're someone who's had hearing loss for a long time and you haven't addressed it and you're always trying to like listen harder and sorry, say that again, sorry, can you speak up? It makes your brain a little bit more tired and it sort of takes away some of that cognitive reserve. There's also the possibility that changes to the parts of the brain that support our listening skills, well, those parts of the brain actually are also quite connected to our memory and our thinking skills. So maybe for some reason, some people are just more predisposed to changes to that particular part of the brain. And because that part of the brain connects to both our hearing and our thinking, that's why we're seeing changes in the two. There's also suggestions that perhaps if you maybe aren't as socially connected as other folks and you're not going out as much or even on Zoom seeing people as much, perhaps that is one of the reasons why you may be developing um, dementia. And we do know that if you have hearing loss, that is a risk factor for social isolation. So, you know, some people will say, I used to go to my bridge class or my book club. It just was too, I, I couldn't hear, so I've just decided to give up and stay home. And so staying home and not being as socially connected is a risk factor for developing cognitive loss as we get older. It's kind of that old idea of use it or lose it, right? That if you're not using your brain and exercising your brain all the time as much as you can, you may start to feel some changes. And then, of course, something that I think is probably particularly relevant now for a lot of folks in COVID is not only that social isolation, but feeling kind of, you know, alone or sad or blue. Um, our mood, our mood has a huge impact on our thinking skills. And we also know that folks with hearing loss can sometimes also be at greater risk of depression. Probably, again, that connection of you know, I can't hear as well with my friends when I go out to dinner, so I'm going to stay home and then feeling sad that I'm missing out on those, those um, experiences. It's probably all interconnected. It's really, really difficult to specifically tease apart one particular um, direction. As, and as I said before, there's really no way to, I guess, prove the cause of it because it wouldn't be ethical for us as researchers to put people into situations where they could be experiencing some of these risk factors, all we can really do is ask people what their history or what their underlying experiences were like, and then try and make connections from that. And you may be thinking to yourself, perhaps you work clinically or you work with a group of folks and you may say, well, okay, but I'll know that someone has hearing loss, right? So I'll be able to include them in the conversation and speak up and use the communication strategies that you're about to teach us, Kate. I'll see that they're wearing a hearing aid. Well, the really interesting thing is that even though I showed you all those high percentages of folks who experience hearing loss, most people with hearing loss do not pursue treatment. That's just the sad reality. Only potentially 14 or so percent of folks um, who have hearing loss that's been identified will actually have hearing aids. And we'll talk a little bit about why that might be. Even those who own hearing aids don't always use them consistently. So I used to hear stories all the time of like, oh, I haven't used it because my battery died or like I was using my mom's hearing aid and it doesn't fit me very well. Lots of interesting stories when you sit behind, you know, near the desk at an audiology clinic, you hear a lot of different things. But some researchers have suggested that, you know, care and maintenance can be a barrier. And it's not, an, it's not a barrier we can't overcome. But, you know, if it is a barrier, it's something that we have to work with. We also know that it often takes people a long time to seek treatment. And I don't think he's on this call, but I don't think he'll mind that if I share his story. But my dad is the perfect example for this. He first got tested for his, his hearing maybe back in 2008 and 2009, I think. And he got his first set of hearing aids last year. 
So it took him about 10 to 11 years. And that was with me being in this field, you know, sending him articles all the time. It takes a long time. That behavioral change is can be lengthy for folks experiencing hearing loss. We do know that, you know, things are moving in the right direction. People are becoming more aware and getting earlier intervention, but it does still sometimes take a long time for people to take that step and get hearing aids. And of course, you know, I'm sure many of you, if you've had family members or yourselves who've who've had hearing aids, you may be saying, oh yeah, I know, like it took my mom forever, or then she got them and she didn't use them. And absolutely, you know, we can address that a little bit too in the Q&A. So, okay, well, okay, they're not wearing a hearing aid, that's fine, but they're, they're going to tell me, right? Like you would think, you know, if you're a medical doctor, you're a GP, like my, my patient will tell me about their hearing loss. Well, not usually. So I love this cartoon. It's a, a couple sitting and the the wife says, you know, I think you need a hearing test. And the husband says, why the heck do I need a hear hearing test? A lot of people don't necessarily realize because it is oftentimes such a slow onset. A lot of people, your, you know, your brain is compensating. You have strategies. Maybe you get closer to people. Maybe you ask for repetition. Maybe you just go, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, even though you didn't hear what the person said and you hope that you're agreeing with the right thing. So unfortunately, if you ask people about their hearing loss, people are not the best at, at reporting their hearing loss or at understanding whether or not they have a hearing loss. So oftentimes, you know, if you, if you do more objective tests, you'll see that someone has, the, has a hearing loss, but if you ask them, they'll say, oh, no, no, no problems with my hearing. So it's a little bit tricky when you're working in the field or even for those of you maybe who, who have suspicion that a family member may be experiencing this, it's a bit tricky because we're notoriously unreliable witnesses when it comes to our own hearing skills, unfortunately. And I'm sure I'm the same too, probably. I, I probably have to turn my music up a little bit louder than I used to. Just naturally over time, things change. So probably the person statistically at least will unlikely to be wearing hearing aids. They're probably not going to just necessarily disclose. So how are we going to know if folks are experiencing hearing loss? Well, you may know things that you do if you're experiencing hearing loss, you know, or things that people have said to you. So, you know, if someone starts to say like, wow, you're really mumbling a lot when you talk and you think, I don't think I'm mumbling. I mean, I haven't changed the way I'm speaking. Or if you're in a busy um, situation, say, and you're, you're watching grandpa and he seems to be like it's too much for him to keep up with so many people talking at once. If all of a sudden the TV is so high that you have to move to the other room and you can still hear the show, um, you know, if you're calling your friend on the phone and all of a sudden, like, she's saying, what? I can't hear you. Speak up. Speak up on the phone. Um, if you find that you go to a noisy environment like a store or a restaurant and it really bothers your ears, these are all some common signs that people may be experiencing changes to their hearing. And again, with the type of hearing loss that's most common as we get older, it's usually a really slow, insidious onset. So we don't necessarily notice. It's only after the fact when you ask people to look back and kind of analyze their own behavior that you realize people say, oh yeah, actually I, that was, you know, maybe four or five years ago at Jean's wedding, it was really difficult for me to hear what, what the speeches were saying. And then you start to think, oh, okay, well maybe that was sort of the first time that you started to notice that there were some changes. So now that I've talked to you a little bit about what those connections are between how our brains change and our, our ears may change, our hearing may change. And the fact that for some people, you know, it might take a long time to seek, to take action, to seek help. Let's talk a little bit about what we can do. So what are some potential solutions for managing hearing loss? So I'm going to run through a few potential tools and we'll also talk about some of the potential barriers because I think it's important to talk about that. You know, why does it take people 10 years? And why do most people not necessarily seek treatment right away? What's going on here? So there are a number of great types of technology. Um, hearing aids have the technology within hearing aids has advanced beyond, I think, what any of us could ever have comprehended. Um, 
you know, the way that perhaps like, I remember my great grandma had hearing aids and I remember her hearing aids and they were always like squealing and making noises. And she usually did not actually wear them because she just found them so bothersome. They were usually in a drawer somewhere. The technology has really improved um, in leaps and bounds over the past decades. There's also a number of other types of devices. So assistive listening devices, things that can help you in the home, maybe to listen better on the phone or when you're listening to the TV. There's things we can do in our environment to try and make it easier for people to hear and communicate. And then there's specific communication strategies that we can use to support friends, family members, clients, colleagues, anyone that we, we know or suspect is experiencing hearing loss. So there are some barriers to seeking treatment. And I think, again, it's important to talk about these because we do know that addressing hearing loss is such an important public health imperative. So from a sort of behavioral change perspective, how can we overcome some of the barriers? That's an important question for us to ask. So the first is that a lot of people are simply, we, we think, or the research suggests, a lot of people may be in denial. And it's not denial because you don't want to admit it, it's just, you know, oh, no, that was that was a really noisy restaurant, or I think my friends are starting to speak a little bit more quietly, or it was really loud outside when I was walking down the street, so that's why I didn't hear what you were saying while we went for a walk, or, you know, it was, it was raining loud on the umbrella. So, you know, people may just not be noticing or may not be at that moment of being able to notice that there have been some changes. I do think this is changing as I speak to you with my headphones in my ears. I do think it's changing um, in terms of the stigma, right? Like people oftentimes now you'll see people out for walks wearing things or talking away to somebody. You think, who are they talking to? You realize they're on, they're on a very small device that we may not even see. I know on a lot of calls, I have friends who who have like the much fancier headphones than I do that don't have cords. And you know, if you're wearing your hair down like this, you may not even see that there's something in the person's ear. So I think with the fact that so many people are using hands-free devices in the car or on their walks, on their runs, I think the stigma around seeing people with things in their ears may be changing. It may become more normal for sort of the youth of today as they age to have things in their ears, but there absolutely was sort of historically a stigma around wearing hearing aids. Um, and I do think that that is changing, that is easy, easing. There's also, speaking of ease, <laughs> ease of accessing services, right? Not everyone lives in a large urban center where there are numerous clinics or opportunities to seek treatment. Um, so location may be absolutely a, a bit of an issue. In the United States, I saw we have a guest visiting us from New Hampshire. Um, there are some FDA approved, what are called sort of OTC over the counter devices that you can buy like on Amazon. So that may, you know, if you live in a more rural area or you don't drive anymore, maybe that's a little bit easier. Some of these things you can program using a phone. So maybe, you know, if you're not so tech savvy, one day your grandson comes over or your granddaughter comes over and helps you program it and you're not able to get to a hearing clinic, but you know, from the safety and comfort of your own home, you can get access to treatment. So that's changing a little bit too. Um, costs, of course, you know, many, many individuals across the lifespan are on a limited budget. Um, here in Ontario, there used to be coverage uh, that was supported by the government every three years. You could get $500 per device. That changed to five years, which is pretty big difference. Um, I think, you know, the cost, of course, of these devices can be an issue, at least in the United States. I believe the average cost of a hearing aid is approximately, I believe it's approximately $1,600. That is a lot of money. Um, you know, if you amortize it out over many years, but that initial cost for folks can be, that can be absolutely a barrier to seeking treatment. Um, we, I know from some of my own research, medical comorbidities may be uh, a barrier. So if you're seeing your physician and you have 50 minutes to talk and you haven't seen them in person for a year and a half, maybe you're going to address some of the more, I hate to say it, but almost like the more, the more pressing concerns. You know, if you've been experiencing pain, you're going to want to spend a lot of time talking to your physician about that. And maybe by the time you get, you know, sent off with a prescription or something, 
you it slipped your mind. You know, you wanted to talk about other types of medical concerns you were having and ugh, hearing loss. I forgot to ask about that. So we do know that sort of on the list of um, priorities, sensory loss is not often at the top. And that's sort of historically, some of the research suggests that. And so that's why um, I know there's a lot of folks working to increase and hopefully if some of your clinicians on the call today, this will help too, but just to increase awareness of this for the medical community, for healthcare workers, that this is something we should always be screening for. And then finally, a lot of folks think that this is just a normal part of aging, right? Like a lot of things change as we get older. I definitely don't run as fast as I used to. Um, you know, maybe my hearing has already changed. I'm not 100% sure, but the research, unfortunately, bear, you know, actually suggest that this may be a part of it. We looked at um, referrals from a memory clinic in a geriatric hospital where you would assume a lot of the, the clinicians are well used to working with older individuals and found that the majority of folks weren't being referred for hearing services, even though if you look at the numbers, probably a lot of them did need to at least get their hearing tested. So it may not be something that everyone is thinking of, so it's not asked about, There, it's, people aren't being referred. Um, so it's something we have to increase awareness of really as a country, because as I said, you know, with people living older and older and longer and longer full lives, we want people to be able to be connected and communicating as well as they can. There also, I think, are some misconceptions about treatment options. So perhaps if you haven't had an experience recently with hearing um, aid technology and you're thinking back, as I sometimes do, to a family member who was unhappy with their devices, you may not realize how far the field has come and that there's a lot, a lot of different options that we can use and that people working within the field can help you try out to find something that works for you and, and fulfills your needs. And another question that you may be thinking is, well, you know, and, and we heard this as well, you see this in the literature, people will say, well, you know, mom's living with Alzheimer's disease. I don't know if it's a good idea for me to get her hearing aids because what if she can't even use them? And so we actually did some research on this. We looked back at years and years of data from our clinic to say, you know, it just so happens we work with a lot of older people. Some of them probably are living with dementia. Are these folks coming to us to get hearing aids? The answer is resoundingly yes. So we know that folks living with dementia, they can they can be tested for hearing aids, they can be fit with hearing aids, they can be, they can keep their hearing aids and use them successfully. Oftentimes with support, absolutely from family or care partners, but it can work for them. And you see benefits of treatment. And this is actually a paper that we published a few years ago now. And what we find, I think, that's so important when we're speaking to this, you know, the Alzheimer's Society is the benefits aren't only shown for the person who's wearing the hearing aids. They can also be shown for care partners. So we call that a secondary benefit. So I often think of my own grandparents. My grandpa clearly you know, it's probably experiencing some changes to his hearing. And I think oftentimes of my grandmother, she was almost like his simultaneous translator when she was alive. You know, we'd go out for dinner and we'd be talking and he'd say what? And she'd say, oh, Katie said this, or, you know, sort of pass along like a bit of broken telephone. So that takes a lot of energy. That takes a lot of work. That means she has to be paying attention. She has to be relaying the information to him. Then he asks the question. It's a lot of brain power to do all that. And you see that in the research, you know, care partners often say, it's a lot of work for me to manage my loved one's hearing, hearing loss. And I do it, I absolutely do it because I want them to stay connected and communicate, but oof, that's a lot for me. So what we've actually seen from some of the research that we did is that if you provide individuals living with dementia with hearing aid, it in, leads to things like qualitative improvement and overall quality of life. They'll say things like, I enjoy going to church more. I'm speaking to my, my partner, my friends more. You can, some research suggests there's reductions in personal expressions for folks. So perhaps if the reason why someone is trying to seek an exit is because they didn't hear you say, oh, come back, we're going to be doing bingo now. Oh, come on back to the main living room. Maybe they didn't hear you saying that. So 
you know, then what it looks like to us is maybe they're trying to exit, they're trying to go to the door, perhaps if they're able to hear that their favorite activity is being offered or their favorite snack is being offered in the common room, they wouldn't have that tendency to be showing that type of wandering expression, wandering behavior. There's also some research to suggest that if you help those living with dementia hear better, it actually reduces the burden that their care partners are feeling. So, you know, it's one less thing you have to worry about. And, and we also, it can be difficult to ask those living with dementia, whether they think they're hearing better, you know, sometimes they're not the most reliable witnesses, but if you talk to care partners, they'll say, yes, actually, I really think mom is doing better. I really think that mom is, um, is hearing a little bit better. Ted, I saw your comment about the different brands of hearing aids. I'll definitely, um, we can address that a little bit about where you can go for that information because unfortunately I cannot, I'm an audiologist, not an audiologist, um, but we can talk a little bit about where you might go to find that information. So some reports from some of the participants I worked with were that my mom is more joyful, which means I'm more joyful. And this was just the most beautiful mother-daughter dyad. Their relationship was just so wonderful to watch. You know, I got to sit with them over months because I went through the whole process. Mom came in to get her hearing tested and then they met again to talk about what kind of hearing aids she would like to get. Then she came for the first day with her hearing aids and then for follow-ups over the months. And I got to see the fact that yes, mom was listening better. Mom could hear better. Mom was more aware and part of the conversation. And that made the daughter a lot happier. Um, one person said, you know, she hangs up on me less, right? Because they can actually, oops, can actually hear a little bit better. Oopsies, my slide just went forward. Um, one thing that's really important, especially if your loved one maybe isn't listening, living with you or is still try living independently, is they're safer, right? If you're trying to call mom and mom's not picking up the phone, maybe you're starting to get a little bit nervous. Or what if the fire alarm's going? She can't hear it. Family members say, you know, it just makes me feel a little bit less nervous. Um, knowing that you know my loved one won't become socially isolated they'll continue to enjoy activities my favorite one here at the bottom is now that they have hearing aids there's no more arguments over getting hearing aids isn't that nice right if you've been one of those people that on average takes 10 years to get help and your family members have been trying to help you and it's been kind of like a row you know oh please like let's make sure you get it and it happens thank goodness one more thing you don't have to worry about right that can be really helpful for care partners. Now, hearing aids may not be for you, may not be something that you're able to look for, um, but there's other, there are other solutions. So there are things such as what we call like personal amplifiers. So a pocket talker that I've shown here in the picture. Um, this is something that even working in a memory clinic, I used to have in my purse with me in, in my briefcase so that if someone came in and it was pretty clear from my history taking that I couldn't really listen, like they definitely couldn't hear me properly, I would oftentimes offer them the use of this particular type of device. Um, it's, a, it's a small, it costs about, I think about $160. Uh, it's a small little device and it has a microphone and the person with the hearing loss can put the headphones on and can just listen a little bit better. And this can be really helpful maybe for people who don't necessarily feel comfortable putting something in their ear or you may be worried that, you know, well, mom's just moved into long-term care. I don't know where the hearing aids are going to go at night. It's a lot harder to lose something like this. It's also more durable. It's, it's a strong plastic. So if mom or dad tend to drop things or slip things off their desk, you know, it's less likely to break the, the, um, for someone maybe who's experiencing changes to their upper limb mobility or arthritis, it's a little bit easier to manipulate. So there's a lot of different solutions. Um, we advocate for this within the long-term care and retirement homes I work with is this idea of sound field systems as well. So instead of just having the headphone or the speaker on the one person, you're actually able to send sort of a beam of sound out. So if there's a lot of folks who are experiencing hearing loss within um, you know, maybe your particular neighborhood or unit at a long-term care home, this can be a really great solution because it's kind of a one, um, one size opportunity for everyone that, you know, the speaker has a microphone and their sound gets sent to everyone a little bit louder. There are also some other types of devices that can make it a little bit easier and maybe give you a bit more comfort if, if your loved one is living alone, that they can be safe in their independent living environment. So a larger telephone that has uh, a sound boost so they can hear you better. Um, over here is actually a visual fire alarm. So a fire alarm 
um, some folks may not hear it, but a brightly colored with a bright light fire alarm, you're likely to see if you're awake. <laughs> and if you're not awake, down here is what's called a bed shaker. So I know it sounds a little ominous, but it literally is a small device that fits under the mattress. And so if, for example, the person has hearing loss and you're worried that maybe the smoke alarm will go off and they won't hear it, the bed will actually move so that the perturba perturbation will actually wake them up and give them that oh, signal to please get up and get out, even if perhaps they didn't hear. So if you have a loved one, you know, maybe your siblings living alone and you're a little worried about them, this may just give you a bit of peace of mind that your brother can be by himself for a little bit longer. We also can think about what we can do, you know, very low cost, no cost modifications to our environment. I currently am not in a quiet environment with minimal distractions. I think my kids know I'm down here, so they're jumping pretty much right over my head in the dining room. But what you want to do is, as much as possible, try to reduce competing noise. So, you know, if the TV's on in the background or the radio's going with CBC, try and turn it down, turn it off, angle them away from that so that at least, you know, the back of your head is to the TV. You don't know if everyone can see I have a TV here, so, you know, the back of your head is to the TV. Use carpeting, wall coverings. A lot of um, restaurants, you know, are so beautiful. There's so much glass and soaring ceilings, but that's actually a terrible environment for, for uh, a terrible auditory environment for listening. If you do go out, you know, try and sit with your back to the, the noisy dining room, for example. Make sure, maybe with COVID, it's a little bit more difficult with the social distancing, but you're sitting as close as you can, you know, um, facing one another, the same eye level, so that you're able to also use your face cues. I know people have been a little concerned with the use of masks because we're not able to necessarily use all those face cues that humans are so good at picking up on. Make sure the lighting is really good so they can see light on your face. We don't necessarily realize how much we rely on people's mouths. And even though, you know, we're not all champion lip readers, but at all times we are probably picking up on a little bit of information just from watching people's lips and tongues and mouths move. So that's a really important other cue. When you're communicating with someone who's experiencing hearing loss, try to use what we call clear speech. What I've seen often in interactions is we try to speak really quiet and, or sorry, really loud and really slow because there is this old stigma, you know, that maybe the person can't keep up as much because of their hearing loss. But actually, you don't want to get too loud because when we speak really loud, it actually distorts the way that we're speaking. It often pitches our voice a little bit higher, and we know that higher frequencies are the ones that are often a bit more of a trouble when we have hearing loss as we get older. So you want to slow down your speech a little bit, maybe a, a little bit louder, but ensure that you're speaking in your, your normal way in just a little bit clearer. You're not trying to distort or use a high-pitched tone to try and gain attention. You're really trying to articulate as well as you can and try to take some pauses. So I personally know I speak more quickly. It's a bit of a bane of mine my whole life. So, you know, something for me to think about is making sure I'm slowing down a little bit, not enough that it's you know, we're not trying to say, hello, how are you? We do not want to be continuing on that stigmatizing way. I've seen, unfortunately, folks um, speaking that way. But using this clear speech idea, providing context for your conversation. Hi, Grandpa, I'm so happy to see you today. Let's talk about this movie I just saw. I just went to the movies. You know, we have vaccine passports here in Ontario, just started today. I'm going to the movies tonight and then launch into the conversation. So the person has a context for what you'll be discussing. Keep sentences short and simple. Repeat as much as you can. Seek feedback to ensure that information has been heard. Grandpa, did you hear me say I'm going to see James Bond? I know you love James Bond. You've seen James Bond before. So you're repeating, you're seeking feedback. And again, as much as possible, seek to minimize background noise. Maximizing those use of visual cues, so ensure your face as much as possible is, vis is visible. Um, again, with our masks, it can be a little bit tricky. If you're working in a setting where you're trying to get someone to pick up on information, using written materials can be very helpful. 
I actually went out to a patio the other night with my husband for the first time in forever. And the menu, there was a QR code on our table and I just held my phone up to it and I scanned through the menu. And then you could just kind of order that way. So it sometimes when a waiter or, or wait staff will come and take your your order, you're kind of worried, like, can they hear me? Do they know what I'm pointing to it on the menu? This was much easier. So using written materials, pictures, objects, you know, um, to talk to the individual so they really clue in to get that context. Uh, you know, sometimes I've seen this before in experiences where someone's meeting with a, a healthcare provider, they'll be turned this way and typing at the computer. Uh-huh, okay, yeah. Mm -hmm. Sure. And then they're asking you questions, but they're looking in the other direction. So making sure that eye contact, that you're not sitting like this, talking with your hand over your mouth. Simple, simple, but, you know, very effective strategies. And also, what's also very important is to encourage use of visual aids. So this is something that when I was working clinically, I'd always say to the individual, did you bring your glasses to the session today? Make sure you bring your glasses because of course we want to be able to be making use of all our senses as well as we can. And I would say the last thing as well is to ask someone, how can I help you communicate better? Maybe they prefer texting. Maybe that's a little bit easier for them, especially in noisy environments. So the last thing I'm going to do, I'm just mindful of time, just a few more minutes here before we can have some questions and answers is, well, maybe you're sitting here today thinking, oh, thanks, Kate, you're preaching to the choir. I already do all of these things with my loved one. Or you're thinking, oh my goodness, this sounds like me. I've been putting this off for a long time, or my loved one has been putting it off for a long time. Uh, you know, it's something that maybe I've brought up with my doctor, but there just never seems to be enough time to discuss it in our appointments, or I haven't been able to see them because everything's been virtual for so long. What are some ways we can advocate for ourselves, our loved ones? Because again, the, our hearing health is a key, key component of our brain health as we age. And so no matter what age, it's important for us to make sure that we're taking good care of our hearing health. So you know, if you have concerns, talk to your doctor. Um, some folks I realize do not have a family doctor. If there's a way for you to get a referral to an ENT, an otolaryngologist, also known as an ear, nose, and throat doctor, you know, maybe if you need to go to a walk-in clinic for this, because I realize some folks just unfortunately don't have the family doctor available to them, try and find a referral or a way to to seek help from a from a physician. Because of course, what you want to make sure is that there's no physical reason um, or medical reason, especially if it's something, you know, a more sudden onset of hearing loss, you want to make sure that sort of medically everything checks out. Um, there's a lot of hearing clinics or, or audiology clinics that will say, you know, free hearing test, and they put it really big on the outside. That's usually because our provincial healthcare system is actually paying for that. Uh, so here in Ontario, you can get one free quote unquote hearing test every year. It just means that our taxes are all paying for it, which we should because hearing health is so important. Um, so maybe, you know, instead of walking by that clinic, knock on the door, or send them an email or give them a call and say, hey, I've, it's been a while. I've been looking at you for a while, but I'd, I'd like to come in and just get, get things checked out. Um, what we found was really helpful is actually sharing this type of information with people. We don't want to do it in a way that's threatening or terrifies people, but, you know, to say, did you know that there's actually a link between how our how our brain thinks as we get older and how our ears are doing, that it's so important for us to think of this even when we're younger. Some of the research suggests that hearing loss may start in our 40s. So I'm almost there. I always think about that because I know about the research. But, you know, just over, over our lifespan to think about how important it is to take care not only of our brain, right? We're always hearing like reduce your stress, make sure you sleep and eat well and exercise. It's good for the brain. We also have to be really careful about taking care of our ears, not listening to music too loud. If we go to concerts, you know, possibly even standing far away from the speakers or wearing um, earphones, like things that we can do to just be a little more cautious about our hearing. If if this is, you know, really ringing a bell for you with a loved one, please be patient and have understanding. This often takes a lot of time for people. There's a lot of barriers that I talked about. Some are sort of systematic or systemic. Some are personal and more psychological. It can take time. It can take repetition. You know, I see this in my own family. It took a long time, but at the end of the day, it's a worthy process. Try and involve your loved one or care recipient, you know, in that process. 
oftentimes, I think it's changing a little bit, but that medical model of, you know, you go see the family doctor and they talk to the daughter instead of the mom, that's definitely changing, but involving your loved one in the process and, you know, baby steps. Maybe you start off with a pocket talker that you use at a family dinner, or you get um, a special device for the TV so it's a little bit easier to listen to TV, or an amplified telephone so it's easier for grandma to call her grandkids once a week. So starting off slow and introductory and sort of easing into it. These may all be some good steps in order to really try and, and address our, our hearing health. So thank you everyone. I'm so delighted to have had the chance to chat with you today. Um, this is my website. You can connect with us on social media, right? Everything's about social media these days. Uh, so I'll stop sharing my screen and I'm going to go and look at, or, or I guess hear what, what folks were talking about in the chat. So, hi, Kate. Uh, so, so far there, there's two questions in the chat. Um, one was around just the ease of wearing a hearing aid when you also wear glasses and a face mask and the issue with them getting caught. And is there any tips around that? Our ears are doing so much these days, aren't they, right? One thing that I have seen that can be helpful, uh, I wish I should have brought one actually, we have some upstairs, is there's, you can see like little plastic devices that actually go around the back of your head and it will hook your, instead of hooking your uh, mask over a loop over the back of your ear, it actually hooks to that device. So I have some of those for my kids actually, because sometimes my little one's only three and sometimes he doesn't like having a loop over his ear. So we'll use that. It's like a little plastic extender. Um, maybe not for folks in BC as much, but here in Ontario, where it's going to get colder sooner. I've also seen folks who have, you know, toques, and you can actually maybe tie a button or sew a little button onto the side of your toque. So if you're out and about your mask loops around your toque, I know my friend is a NICU nurse and that's what she has on her scrub caps. She doesn't actually, it's too long to wear for your whole shift, um, to wear your, your mask loop behind your ear. So her scrub caps have like little, almost like little buttons that have been sewn on. And so she, she loops her mask up like that over, um, there are different forms, different types of hearing aids. Some hearing aids do have that, we call them BTE, the behind the ear. Some go directly right in the ear canal so they don't loop up behind. Again, an audiologist or a hearing care specialist would be able to help you with that, but there are different options, especially now with COVID, we're wearing a lot of things that may be a little bit easier at, um, you know, not getting getting stuck because, of course, you do not want to lose a hearing aid, right? They are very expensive and they're also very important for us to wear. Um, you know, I think of my own dad. He wears glasses and hearing aids and he's a college professor, so he wears his mask all day to teach and his ears are doing a lot of work, but he actually went back because I suggested to him. He wears the kind where the receiver is behind the ear and what he does is he kind of puts his I don't know how to describe it. Maybe I should take a picture of him next time I do this. But he kind of rests his glasses a little bit up here. Um, and that seems to work well with his hearing aids. So uh, at least in Ontario, at least where I was working, you know, once you're, once you're fit with a hearing aid, there may be adjustments, right? So if, if this is something new and you have to work it all with all the gadgets that are on your head now, you know, you can go back and try and get different fittings. If you are someone who wears glasses, that's something you'll talk about with your hearing care specialist, and maybe they can suggest something that's more inside the ear that may be a little bit easier for you to wear. But absolutely, that's something that can be a, a little bit more for folks to have to think about now to consider during COVID. Thank you. Yeah, those are some good options there. Um, there was another question. I'm not sure how much you can speak on this, but the regarding the range in prices for different brands and then also about ordering online and whether that would be recommended opposed to going in and actually seeing somebody in person. Um, it might be a, a lower cost option to, to go so do so online. Absolutely. I think, um, you know, I from where I'm coming and like my background, obviously my suggestion would always be if you can and you're able to, to at least try and have an assessment with an audiologist, you know, someone with uh, advanced training in hearing care and hearing care solutions. But at the same time, that may not be accessible for everyone or it may not be something that, you know, from a cost perspective, taking on a hearing aid purchase is something you can do. So 
you know, I think probably I would always suggest the best route would be to see a hearing instrument specialist or an audiologist, but looking at things online could potentially be a way um, for you to, to, to access care. We did have a grant actually a few years ago where we looked at sort of over the counter devices for folks and they did enjoy them. You know, these were for low cost, um, uh, these were low cost devices for low income seniors living in Toronto and they, they had to purchase them. I think the most expensive one, I believe was about $350. Um, and so that was for them a very viable option. So, you know, something about this where like, I would always suggest something is better than nothing. <laughs> So, you know, there's for all of the care that we receive, there's always sort of like the gold standard. But if there's other things that you can do that's more accessible for you or a loved one, I would always suggest starting with that. I did see a, a comment from someone about different manufacturers. Again, all the different manufacturers offer a variety of price points. And what may be important for someone may only be found in some of the manufacturers. So for example, there's now rechargeable hearing aids where you don't necessarily have to fiddle with the battery. You put the hearing aid into a charger, yet another charger in our house, right? But you put the hearing aid into a charger at night, but not all the manufacturers are doing that. I think most of them now are. Um, you know, you may want, if you're a musician, you may want a hearing aid that allows you to uh, set the sound when you're playing the music with your band. Not all manufacturers will have all of those different options. So that's why, again, you know, speaking to someone who's so well versed in this, um, manufacturers, I think probably now it's virtual, but in the before times, you know, they would come to the clinic multiple times a year to talk about all the new devices, the new products, the new pricing, so that, you know, the audiologists were being kept abreast of all the new improvements in, in the field. Um, cause there was a lot, there was a lot of improvements. Um, Jennifer, you're asking why are hearing aids so expensive? Is it truly justified? I mean, the technology that is contained in a hearing aid, uh, as part of my postdoc, I actually went to Switzerland, um, to a hearing aid manufacturer and met with some of, you know, the engineers and just listening to the things that they're doing, the years and decades of development into these devices. It's, it's kind of thinking like a car, right? Like there's a wide range of car pricing. Um, even when I bought my car, there was like five levels of my car and I bought the second cheapest level. It still drives, it does what it can, but you know, my, my, my steering wheel isn't heated, right? My hands get cold. Um, so hearing aids come in a wide variety of price points. So some are more expensive than others. Some will do more things than others. But again, if a cost is more of a concern or an issue for folks, it's something to talk about with someone who specializes in this because they'll be able to suggest different options for you, right? That's really what they specialize in. And the hearing care specialists, at least that I know, you know, their number one goal is to try and provide you with a product that will work for you, will meet your needs, and also will be within, you know, obviously within your budget as well. So, you know, something to think about. But yeah, there, I mean, there's a wide range of, of prices as well, for sure. Um, yes, I will. Uh, thanks, Maureen. Uh, Maureen is a, is, says she and her husband both have hearing aids. And absolutely, it's important to know that each set of hearing aids is tuned to each individual person. So once you have been fit with your hearing aids, there's actually specific uh, like acoustic targets that the, the audiologist will help you reach. And uh, usually that starts off sort of slow because your brain needs to get used to all these new sounds. And over a bit of time, the, the hearing aid actually adjusts itself to you as you become more comfortable listening to it. So, so these are sort of individually um, uh, uh, modified to ensure that they're meeting your specific needs. So um, it's not really such a one size fits all because everyone's ear size is different. Everyone's hearing needs are different. Everyone's environments are a little bit different. Uh, so yes, I'm obviously I'm, I'm a strong supporter of audiologists as you can see. <laughs> I've worked for, with them um, so successfully and just seen, you know, the incredible work that they do. Uh, a lot of the time um, that I spent was literally just like sitting in the corner of an office watching the connection, the communication, the, the clinical service provision uh, and, and understanding how that changes if we do, if we do have a client that's living with dementia and, and modifications that can be made for those folks. Um, Jennifer asks, I don't know, I don't want to go over, but you know, lots of good questions coming in. Jennifer's asking, 
how long should you wear your hearing aid? So the thing about hearing aids is that some of the research suggests that our brains get used to them. And so the more we wear them, uh, the better, because our brains are actually basically acclimating to have these new sounds. So except for things where you might be getting wet <laughs> or if you're getting sweaty, like you don't want to wear them if you if you um, go cross-country skiing or something like that where your ears could get sweaty or if you play squash or go for a swim, definitely don't wear them. But um, oftentimes folks are, you know, suggested again and this is if this is something you're pursuing you would absolutely talk about this with a hearing care specialist but this is something that we you know is suggested that you wear them a lot of the time um no we we wouldn't recommend wearing i don't think hearing aids while you're sleeping it could be uncomfortable too right get like the roll over on it, it could hurt you or get lost in the bed cloths or something yeah I am going to jump in and just say thank you so much, 